Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English. Learn to speak English like a native. And the father of the effortless English system that trains you to speak English powerfully, speak English confidently, of course, speak English fluently, think in English, no translating, no translating, not your language, translate to English, speak Listen, translate again. No, 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 no. Think in English. Speak English effortlessly. And you make that spring resolution and join and commit to my VIP program today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Join and commit to my VIP program today. As I said, spring resolutions. We have New Year's resolutions, right? At the New Year, January 1st, lots of people decide on a big goal for this year or several goals. Several goals for this year. This year I will do this. I will speak English fluently and powerfully this year, 2019. I will lose weight. I will be more fit. I will be more healthy. I will make more money. But as I discussed in my last show, I feel actually that uh, New Year's is maybe not the best time to do that goal setting. Of course, I understand why. It's, it's, a, it's symbolic, we say. Symbolic, right? A symbol, it means it's something represents something else. A symbol. So, New Year's, right? It's a symbol of beginning again. A new beginning. Right? Beginning a new year. 2019. January 1st. So, that's why... We traditionally, you know why we have this idea of New Year's resolutions, why we do it at the New Year, January 1st. However, as I said, I think that actually the the problem with New Year's resolutions is, is that it goes against some of the natural cycles that we have. Let's talk about that. Cycles. Cycles of time. Cycles of time. What is cycle? Cycle is connected to the word circle in meaning. It has the idea of something that goes in circles. We say cycle. C-Y-C-L-E-S, right? Like bicycle. Same word. Same root word. Bicycle. Why do we call it a bicycle, right? You have two wheels that go around. You have two pedals to make it go that go around. So it's two cycles, right? Two circles. Bicycle. There's also something called a unicycle. A unicycle has only one wheel. One wheel that goes around, right? It has two pedals, but it has one wheel. You see them like the circus sometimes. The people ride on a unicycle. Una, uni, U-N-I means one. One cycle, one circle. We use this word cycle or cycles with time, right? There are many natural cycles of time. For example, we have what you know we call the solar cycle. Solar, S O L A R, solar means uh, sun, connected to the sun, something about the sun. So a solar cycle, it means it's a, a cycle, a circle, a period of time connected to the sun. Of course, what is that? Obviously, it's a day, one day, 24 hours. That's a solar cycle. It means that, of course, 
it appears, we, we look, it looks like the sun is going around us in a circle. Of course, we know that's not true. We know that the earth is actually spinning around in a circle. But for us, it appears in the sky, it looks like the sun is coming up and going around and then going down, right? And then going behind the earth and then coming back up again, right? And each circle is a day. That's a cycle of time, a 24-hour cycle, a solar cycle, a daily cycle of time. Now we have monthly cycles too, of course. Those are connected to the moon. If we're talking again about the sky, right? The moon goes through cycles, right? We have what's called a new moon, which is uh, basically it's not light, it's dark. You can still see it usually, just the outline, but it's not bright. And then we have different kinds of crescent moons. That's where it's just part of the moon is light. There's a half moon. And of course, the full moon. And this is about, the cycle is about one month. Not exactly. I think it's actually, you know, 24, 28 days rather. 28 days. So, but that's a, what's called a lunar cycle. Lunar means connected to the moon or about the moon, lunar, a lunar cycle. We could also just say a monthly cycle. We have weekly cycles. Now, these are more human-made, right? But Monday to Sunday, right? We have Monday to Friday is the normal cycle, right? means repeating time. When we're talking about time and cycles, we're talking about things that repeat in time. They're regular, right? In this kind of a circle. So, the normal business working week. What, it starts on Monday morning, right? And then you work and then you go until Friday afternoon. And then you have your holiday, your weekend. So Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, you have your weekend. You have the weekend. And then what? Then it starts again. This is why it kind of has like a circle, right? Because then the next Monday, what? A new work week begins again. Monday morning, you go back to work. And then you repeat it. It repeats again and again and again and again every week, repeating this cycle. Work week cycle. It's a weekly cycle. Right? Well, of course, we have seasonal cycles. Right? Spring, summer, winter, fall. Well, spring, summer, fall, winter. Spring, summer, fall, winter. And then they repeat because after winter, what? We get spring again, right? So again, it's kind of circular. It keeps coming back. Why is this important? What does this have to do? Well, here's the thing. These, first of all, we have the natural cycles, the cycles of nature. So sun and moon and, and, all, and all these other, you know, seasons, things like that. Um, and they affect us quite, they affect us biologically. You know, our bodies change. Our bodies definitely change and our minds and our emotions all change too. For example, with the seasons. I, I was talking about this in the last show. It's quite normal that in the springtime, the days are getting longer, the weather gets warmer, that our physical energy, you know, our body and by our bodies change and we actually start to feel more physically energetic. Not only humans, but many, many different animals. This happens in the spring. And then in the summer, you know, often we have our kind of our highest level of energy. Because, right, there's just, you know, this, it's, it's warm, it's hot outside. There's, traditionally, there's plenty of food, right? During this period of time, lots and lots and lots of sunlight. So it's, you know, a time of maximum energy in nature and also in, in our own bodies, usually. And then, of course, what happens, you know, with fall, but especially when winter comes, then the days get very short, it gets cold, in the past, before our great technology, in the past, you know, there was less food. So this was a time when you might be a little more hungry. And so naturally, energy would drop, right? There's less energy coming from the sun, but also in, in, our, in our bodies, our physical energy would drop, our mental energy. It was traditionally a time of resting, 
you know, for farmers, they, they couldn't grow in the winter. So this is a time where people stayed more in their homes and near the fire, right? And uh, they did more quiet things. And it was just a time of a little bit lower energy, more restful. So understanding this, if we understand this to be true, and we can even notice this in ourselves, then we can see, ah, we can use this. This is why it's important. Because see, we're not connected to this idea of cycles anymore so much. Because we live in this modern world, you know, with we have electricity and heat and air conditioning and all this. So we kind of forget about these cycles, but these cycles do affect us. They have, cycles affect us mentally and physically and emotionally. If you try to fight a natural cycle, if you try to go against it, everything becomes very difficult, much more difficult. But if you go with, if you work with a cycle, then everything becomes and feels much easier. So again, back to our example of resolutions. Instead of making a, a year, an annual, a year resolution, a big goal, instead of doing that in January when your energy is probably lower, right? It's dark, it's the middle of winter, it's cold in many places. Of course, you know, down in the south, southern hemisphere, it's, everything's backwards, it's reversed. In the tropics, they don't need to worry about this. But in certainly most of the northern hemisphere, it means the northern part of the earth, uh, in, the, in January, it is winter time. And this is traditionally the time again where mentally and emotionally and even physically, energy is lowest. That's actually not the best time to start a big new project and start big, difficult new goals, Right? When your energy is lowest. The best time is when your energy is starting to increase. You get that feeling of like, ah, I've got more energy. I've got more emotion. I've got more excitement now. Everything's coming alive again in the springtime. That's the best time to make those new goals. That's the be best time to start those new projects. It's the best time to, uh, you know, join my VIP program and really commit to speaking fluently and powerfully this year. Now is the time, right at the beginning of spring. Why? Because you'll start and then every week your energy is going to naturally be going up. Every week the weather's getting better, the sun's coming out more. You're, gonna, you're naturally going to feel better. This will support, this will help your goal. All your goals will help your goal of, uh, you know, the VIP program and learning English. It'll help your goal of exercising more, eating better, making money, in, whatever you want to do. That springtime energy and happiness and sunlight, all of this will help. It's such a great time to start new things. And I realize this myself, especially with exercise, that um, I don't start a new difficult goal or exercise program, I don't start it in the winter because I, I, I know myself now and I've realized that, you know, the natural cycles also that in the winter, I do less exercise. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. If In the past when I've been, you know, when I was uh, serious about running and wanting to do marathons, but I just... I, I, there was maybe there was one winter I seriously trained during the winter, but that's because I had a big event. I had the Camino de Santiago coming, so I trained all winter. I ran in the snow, and it was okay. But overall, naturally, it just seems that when the winter comes, I don't like running in the cold, and it's kind of dark, and my my motivation and my energy for running or doing other exercise, you know, push-ups and pull-ups, all of those things, it all drops. I don't stop. I don't stop completely. That's not good. But I just, I'll, I do everything much less. I do everything a little easier. If I'm focusing on push-ups and pull-ups and calisthenics, right, body weight exercise, I continue to do them, but maybe I do it fewer times per week and, uh, you know, a little bit less 
um, repetitions or a little bit fewer repetitions or a little bit less weight. Sometimes I use weights. And then when I decide, I, oh, I really want to increase everything and get and try to get stronger or run longer or start a new running program, springtime is usually the very best time to do that. So I encourage you. I know that, you know, of course, you want to improve your spoken English and you want to speak English fluently. You want to speak powerfully and confidently. Well, this is such a good time to start now. Even if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, the the weather down there, you know, down in Brazil and in the tropics is still going to be fine, right? You're lucky because you have good weather most of the year. It seems strange, but really, the climate, the weather, the seasons, they do affect you. They will affect you. They will affect your energy level. They will affect your body. They will affect you mentally. This comes back again to this idea of, of going with cycles. You know, in there, you know, I like this uh, philosophy of Taoism. It's a Chinese philosophy. And the basic idea, the very basic idea of Taoism is to go with nature not against it. So understand nature and don't fight it. Nature means your own nature, right? You have a nature, meaning you have a a kind of personality. You have strong points. You have weak points. You have things you are naturally good at, naturally enjoy, and you have other things that you just, uh, you're naturally weak at and you really don't like. Instead of fighting against that, go with it. Let me give you another example. Daily cycles with your English learning. Use daily cycles to get the best result when you, for example, when you're listening to the VIP audios. All of us have a natural daily cycle, a physical, mental, emotional energy cycle. And it's different. So in English, you know, we'll say, we we usually describe people, we'll say, ah, he is a morning person. Or you might say, I'm not a morning person. I'm a night person. What does that mean? Well, it means that some people just naturally seem to have a lot more energy in the morning. They wake up and very quickly, they have a lot of energy. They just have the most energy, the most focus, the best concentration in the morning. These are people, when, when they exercise, they like to exercise in the morning. Uh, when they're doing work, they do their best work in the morning. If they're studying, they do the best in the morning. They have the best concentration. They remember the best. They learn the best in the morning. Other people, of course, night people, are the opposite. They seem to have the most energy mental and physical, you know, in the evenings or at night. Some people are very late night people. So, for example, I know myself, I'm mostly a night person. I'm a little bit less of a night person than I used to be. When I was younger, I was a a late night person. I just seemed to have the most energy after 10 p.m. and I could easily stay up till 2 or 3 p.m. I mean, 3 a.m., you know, three in the morning, I could stay up after midnight and my I'd be, you know, just really awake and full of energy. And uh, that's when I would do a lot of reading. And uh, back in my 20s and as a teenager, I used to hang out with my friends at that time. And we would play, you know, war games and board games and do fun stuff. And, uh, you know, it was always late at night. It was so much fun. Even now, still, you know, I know that that. I'm better in the mornings, but it's not my best time. I also know that there's a certain time in the afternoon that I have my lowest energy. I don't know why, but there's a certain time in the afternoon. It's almost the same every single day that my energy will drop for a couple hours. For just a couple hours, uh, my energy will drop and I just uh, I feel kind of tired. Sometimes I'll even feel sleepy. But then what happens is then after a couple hours, my energy starts coming back again. And then by now, it's really more early evening, I'll find that I'm wide awake again. 
In fact, even if I don't get enough sleep, let's say I get no sleep one night. So the next day I feel terrible, right? Next day I feel so tired. I wake up, I, well, I, I get no sleep. So in the morning I just feel horrible. In the afternoon I feel terrible. At my lowest time I feel really terrible. But then somehow, I don't know why, but somehow at night, I will always wake up. Even though I got no sleep the night before, there's a certain time at night when it just seems all my tiredness will disappear. And at least for a few hours, I'll feel energetic again. I'll feel wide awake, completely awake. It's just that natural cycle. That's mine. And it's different for everybody. But if, if you know this, then you can plan to do your most important work at the best time, right? Like it would be really stupid for me if I was trying to um, record my effortless English shows when my energy is the lowest. If I tried to do it at the time in the afternoon when I know my energy is low, well, then my, my shows would be terrible. I'd, be, I'd sound really sleepy all the time, right? Same thing with exercise. I know now I actually do pretty well in the late mornings. Early mornings, I'm not so good, but I know late mornings is uh, my energy goes up pretty well. And that's when I usually try to do exercise, physical exercise. So this is, this is part of time management. Again, a lot of people talk about time management, managing your time. That's the secret to get a lot done, to be productive, to get good results. But I don't agree. Don't, I don't agree with that. I think it's energy management is what most people need, not time. Energy management. People don't manage their energy during the day. Too many people, they don't notice when their energy is really high every day and when their energy is low. Like some people, they try to force themselves to exercise early in the morning. Some people try to do this, even though they're not morning people, even though they're actually really tired, very, very low energy in the morning, and they try to force themselves to do some exercise, but it always feels like a, a big fight. It always feels difficult. They have to use a lot of willpower. And, you know, typically, normally, they'll eventually quit. But the reason is they're trying it at the wrong time of day. Maybe their energy is actually highest around lunchtime. Maybe they should be do, doing exercise on their lunch break. Or maybe they should wait till, the, till they get finished with work or with school and do it in the late afternoon. You have to know yourself. You have to know these natural cycles. And again, we all have different ones. And of course, the opposite is true. Some people, if you're a morning person, don't wait till the afternoon to try to exercise. Then that's when you should do it. So you're following these natural cycles and you'll get much, 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 much better results. Now, another kind of cycle we could call a lifetime cycle or a life cycle. There's a, an idea, for example, that uh, in uh, India mostly, maybe India and Nepal, where they have an idea, they kind of divide up life, this idea that there are, you know, four main, four major time periods of your life, cycles. Again, that if you go with these cycles, if you follow these cycles, you will have the happiest life, the most you know, productive life, the best life for you. And the idea, of course, is when you're young, you're in the learning time, right? That's the learning cycle, the learning period. It seems obvious. And so that, you know, for young people, and young means all the way maybe to, I don't know, 20 to 25, something like that, that, okay, you're mostly, you're mostly a student, a learner. Even if you're working, you're really working for experience. You're working to learn, not really working for money so much. But then eventually you have to leave that, right? Because if you stay in that forever, then uh, it's like you're forever a child, right? If you're 60 years old and you're still only a student and nothing else, you're not contributing in any way well then it's kind of like you're a, you're still a child right there's it's there, there's a time to leave that you of course you're always learning we're always learning lifelong learning but at some point in your life you have to become an adult right and this is the second phase the second phase they call it householder 
it's kind of an Indian. It's English, but it's kind of, we don't really say it in America. It's not an American uh, word. We don't use that word. But Indians use it a lot. Householder. What's a householder? American English, we would say something like a family man or working man, if for a man. Um, but basically, this is the time we could just say this is where you're part of society. You know, you're, you're working, you're raising a family, you're raising children, you typically. Uh, maybe you're starting a business, uh, you're starting your career, you have to make money uh, for yourself and for your family. So you're really kind of right in the middle of society, right? You're, you're the, the, the main working part of society. And if you're a woman, you know, same thing, or maybe you're a mom at home and you're raising children. But you're basically, you're doing the, the basic adult duties, right? The, the basic duties of an adult. This is the second one. Now, in this um, kind of traditional Indian system, uh, they say it goes till you're about 50 or so. Of course, the times are not exact, but that's the second. The third one, what's the third one? The third one is, is where you change and you focus on you kind of part-time retire we could call this you could call this part-time retire and you become an advisor an advisor a teacher a mentor so now instead of focusing on making money you know at this point hopefully you've made enough money you might still have a job you might still have a business but it's not the most important thing you partly retire so maybe you're only working part-time at this time, at this point, in the third period of your life, you might cut back and only work part time, and the rest of the time you focus on what? On helping, teaching, especially young people. You become a mentor, an advisor. Your focus is to contribute, but not through you know making money and working so much, but more on helping and advising and coaching and teaching. Because now you have a lot of life experience that you can share with other people. So you're focused on contributing in this way. And you're going to focus much, much less on material things. You're, mu you're less, much less focused on money and other you know, politics, power, anything like that in society. And then finally, the fourth cycle or period, life cycle, would be a full retirement where you focus completely on the spiritual. So, of course, this is, you know, they say, uh, you know, around age 75 and after. And that at this point, really, it's time to let go of material goals, right? When you're 75, uh, hopefully you're not still trying to make lots and lots of money because you're getting to the end of your life. And you're not taking that money with you, <laughs> quite obviously. So it, it's, it is quite logically a time to focus on the spiritual, right? What is the meaning of life? Uh, what is the nature of life and death? What is the nature of God? What is the nature of what comes after death? All of these things. So a spiritual focus, 100% spiritual focus. I quite like it. I quite like this system. It's very nice. I think it's very logical and uh, I think it's very wise. You know, it, this is um, another thing I see, especially in my own culture, American culture, where we have lost this idea. Now, this, this used to be a very common idea, that what I just described. You know, the, I described the Indian description, but I think most uh, traditional cultures had something like this same idea. Right, that it, of course, that as you move through life, there are different time periods, right, where you're focusing on different things, you know, right? You focus on different things in life when you're 20 than when you're 70. Seems quite obvious, right? But in fact, our culture in the United States, and I think again, it's affecting the whole global culture, is that we're losing this and we're starting to see people who, even you know, at the age of 70 and older that they are indeed lost in a way. They're still focused on 
in some ways acting like teenagers or children. They're still focused, for example, on material things, money and money and money and getting more stuff. Or they're focused on, you know, just entertainment and Hollywood and all this other kind of stuff like that. And still acting like a teenager and still wanting to to buy lots of cool things. You know, very materialistic mindset. And they're 70 or 75 years old. It's kind of strange. It's It's actually a little sad. Or even younger than that, right? You know, that third time when you should be the advisor, you become the mentor. This again was something you found in all traditional cultures around the world, this idea that there's a time when you contribute and you contribute by being a mentor to younger people. And we know now that our younger people so desperately need this. They need it so much. They don't have it. Our young people, they don't have anyone helping them or guiding them or advising them anymore. Right? What? Not school teachers give terrible advice. It's just the the lies of school. But what happens once they graduate from that? Who's helping them figure out how to get a, create a successful business or how to be great parents themselves, how to choose a good woman or a good man to marry, how to decide, you know, their life purpose their, and the meaning of their life and how to have a, a career, right, jobs, a career that feels meaningful to them and makes them happy. And all of these uh, in how to be more financially free and, uh, you know, spiritual questions, all of these things, none of them are taught in schools. Sadly, many parents don't teach these things to their children. They should, but they don't. And so, no surprise, we have so many young people who, they're going into that second part, right? Adulthood. They're supposed to be starting families and careers and becoming adults and, you know, the main part of society, but they're lost. They're lost. They don't, they, they have, they're confused. Why? Because they don't have that generation above them giving them that great coaching and mentoring and advice, you know, patiently, wisely. It's like our whole society is stuck at the teenager level, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's sad. It's sad. So, and it's sad for everybody. It's sad for the young people. And it's sad for older people because this gives your life great meaning when you're older. You have something to contribute. If you're still trying to act like a kid and uh, you just get lots of stuff, then, of course, like there's this a loss of meaning, right? And we see it again so many uh, in the West, especially, where people don't age well and they don't die well, right? They're, they're lonely. They feel like their life has no meaning. Nobody cares about them or respects them. It's, it's a lonely, lonely process of aging. Very sad. So what used to be so wonderful, these traditional life cycles, life periods that gave meaning to your life at each age, right? At each age you had a, a purpose, a clear purpose. And now it's, you know, thanks to globalism and the kind of corporate Marxist type globalism they've destroyed all this in so many countries and more and more countries it's sad so we have to bring it back we have to bring it back I can't pronounce the Chinese correctly sorry but my bad English pronunciation is Wu Wei Wu Wei I've talked about this idea many times Wu Wei Effortless English, the name Effortless English comes from this idea, Wu Wei. It's Taoism again. T-A-O-I-S-M, Taoism. And Wu Wei is a Taoist, it's a Chinese word, and it means to go with nature, to harmonize with nature. The basic idea, the simple idea is this. You imagine you're in a boat, you're in a boat, and you're on a river. You're on a boat, and it's a powerful, strong river. 
which is easier if you try to go up the river, upstream against the water, right? You can try, you can do it for a while, right? But it's very tough. You have to paddle, right? You have to work so hard to try to go up, up, up against the water. And eventually you become exhausted. It's so tough. But if you just relax and turn around and go with the water, you go downstream. That's what we say in English. Go downstream. You're going down. You're going with the water. Now the water is pushing you. Now it's easy. You don't have to work very hard. You can just kind of steer, right? You can just try to go, you know, go left or go right. Choose the direction. But you don't have to use energy to go downstream. This is the idea of Wu Wei. In all these examples we're talking about today, of looking at all these different kinds of cycles, you know, daily cycles of your energy. What time of day are you energetic? What time of day are you less energetic? You know, when which times in the week during the week are you really busy and tired, and which times during the week are you really motivated? Maybe even months, sometime during the month. You just seem to, you know, be happier or more energized and others less so. Some seasons, like spring, naturally seem to bring more happiness, better, you know, happier emotions. And other seasons, such as the middle of winter, do the opposite. And during our lifetimes, we naturally go through these natural cycles or time periods. And they repeat again and again for for every human. And on and on and on we can look at this. And we can see with each of these examples and many more examples, this central idea, this main idea, which is the main idea of effortless English, when you're for English learning, which is to go with nature, go downstream, and everything becomes more enjoyable. Everything becomes easier. Everything becomes more effective, more successful when you're not fighting against nature. That's why grammar rules and all that stuff, that's why they don't work. You know, trying to memorize all those grammar rules from the textbooks, the way the schools teach you. It's, it's not natural. That's, you're trying to go upstream. You're trying to force your brain to memorize hundreds of rules, logical rules, formulas, really. And then remember them instantly and use them correctly during a fast, real conversation. That is unnatural. That's not how you use your own language. When you speak your own language fluently, you're not thinking of all those grammar rules. You're not thinking at all. It's all happening, we would say, subconsciously or unconsciously or intuitively is another word, right? Is Some kind of automatic process is happening when you are speaking your language. You're using the correct verbs. You're using the correct pronunciation. But you're not thinking about rules while you do that, right? Just like right now, every sentence I'm saying to you, I'm not thinking about past tense or present tense or future or perfect tense. I'm not thinking about, oh, this is, uh, you know, put my tongue to the top of my mouth to make th- this sound. and Right? I'm not thinking consciously about any of that. That's why the school way of teaching it's anti-wu way it's anti-nature that's why it feels so painful that's why it feels so boring that's why it feels so difficult that's why it's not effective it doesn't work that's why the results are so bad that's why you need to use so much energy and time for so-so results because you're trying to go up the river. Oh, you're fighting, 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 trying to fight up that river. I'm, I will force my brain to remember these grammar rules. I will force my brain to memorize all of these vocabulary words. Ah, force, force, force. Up the river, up the river. I'll do it, I'll do it. Ah, but eventually most people get tired and they just stop and they quit. 
a few, you know, there are a few superhuman, right? There are a few people who just have so much uh, willpower and energy and they will fight and fight and fight and fight and they will go up the river, right? They're sweating, they're tired, but they'll do it. But it's just crazy. So they might get some success in an anti-natural way, in an unnatural way. It, It is possible to get some success unnaturally, but it is so, so, so tough. So difficult. So much wasted time and energy. This is for English. This is for everything in life. So the idea of effortless English, for example, is to go downstream. So that we look at the natural way of learning a language. Who are we looking at? Well, we're looking at babies and small children, right? That's where people learn a language most naturally. You learn your own language most naturally as a baby and a small child. We say effortlessly. Uh, actually, it probably was a lot of effort. It took several years, right? You, you couldn't understand your language immediately. And you for a long time, there was confusion. Your parents were trying to talk to you and you didn't understand. And you would cry as a little baby. Ah, I'm hungry. But you didn't know how to say I'm hungry. So you just cry. Ah, and they would look at you and they didn't know what the problem was and they would guess. And so it was a long process, right? But it was natural. It was natural. They were not teaching you grammar rules. You were not using a textbook. It was this natural communication back and forth, back and forth. As you got a little bit older, you started to understand some basic words, some basic phrases. You could communicate a little bit. Then what happens? Well, most parents they start to tell stories, right? They get little storybooks. So they either read storybooks or they tell you stories. And of course, you do continue everyday communication, normal communication, just playing, usually just playing around. And that's how you learned vocabulary. That's how you learned grammar, spoken grammar. And by the time by you're five years old, you're six, you're seven, you're a fluent speaker of your language. You mostly use correct grammar, not always. Little kids make mistakes sometimes, but mostly, right? I, I know, you know, my nieces and nephews, when they're about, I don't know, six or seven years old, their grammar is pretty good, pretty good. They use mostly the correct verb tenses. They know how to do, you know, possessive and all the kind of basic normal grammar, the most common grammar. They can do it. They do it very well. But they have no idea. You, you can, if you ask them, they, don't, they, they have no idea about verb tenses. They don't even know they're doing it. They don't even realize consciously that they're doing something called grammar. They, they don't even know what that means. They don't even know what grammar is. They don't even know what the word grammar means at all. They don't know verb tenses. They just know, oh, well, yesterday I ate and today and now I'm eating. They just use it correctly, but they, they really, they can't explain it to you. They don't know consciously why they're doing it. They just know it sounds right. If you ask a kid, well, why do you say this? Why do you say yesterday I ate? And why do you say now I'm eating? Right? Ate and eating, different verb forms. Why do you say that? If you ask a seven-year-old American kid, most of them will say, it sounds right. Well, because it sounds right. It just sounds right. They're not going to say, oh, well, that's the past tense and this is the progressive. And they, they, they're not even going to say tense. They have no idea what tense is. <laughs> they have no idea what verb conjugation means. And yet, they're doing it almost perfectly, fluently. That's nature. That's going with nature. That's why effortless English. Why? Because when those children speak, it's effortless. They're not thinking about any of that. They never learned it. And yet they're doing it all correctly. They speak English effortlessly with no thought, no analyzing, no memorization of rules. No textbooks. They learn from stories. They learn from real communication. They learn from life. And it's all completely natural, right? They're going downstream. This is Wu Wei. This is going with nature. It's a little different for you as an adult learning a foreign language, but 
Effortless English uses these same ideas. We're trying to copy nature. We're trying to go with nature as you learn as an adult. Actually, as an adult, you have some advantages. You know, you're older, you have more life experience. You already have your own language that you speak perfectly or almost perfectly. So this actually gives you great advantages. It's, it's fantastic. The disadvantage, the really the main disadvantage for adults is they they get confused and they try to go against nature. And they, they try to use all these textbook methods and all this stuff and then they make everything much harder than necessary. But when you start going with nature, you start following nature. You know, my VIP program is designed to be a natural way of learning. And of course, all my courses are. And even just, you know, I tell you in your book, in my book, how to do it. Going with nature, everything feels easier, it's faster, it's more effective. By the way, this is the same exact thing you should do if you're trying to improve your health and your fitness. Because see, again, a lot of people will try to improve their health and fitness. They'll go and they'll do research, for example. Let's talk about fitness. It's easy. Just fitness. So fitness means like your physical ability, right? Not, so we're not talking about eating. We're just talking about exercise. So let's say running. You decide you want to run. So a lot of people will go out and they'll buy a book on running. Or they'll go online and they'll find some programs for running. And they'll just start following it. I've mentioned this example before. That's fine. I mean, that's how you start. You have to start with something gives you an idea. But the problem is that a lot of people will just follow the program blindly. They just follow it. like Again, like a textbook, like an English textbook. They just, okay, today I have to do this. And then tomorrow I run three miles. And then the next day I do four miles. And then the next day a uh, break. And then the next day five miles. And they're just following this program in the book or from the program they found. But they're not focusing on nature. What does that mean? It means if you're doing that, it's okay to start that way. But you must pay attention. What does that mean, nature? It means, mainly it means your own body. You should notice your own body. How is your body reacting to the running, to the program? Because, you know... Everybody has a different nature, different size bodies. Some people are in really good shape. Some, some people are in terrible shape. Some people are, you know, young and they're 18 and other people are, you know, 60 starting to run. Men, women, different body types, tall and thin or short and kind of stocky. All these differences, different health issues. So all of that makes everybody different. So you, everybody cannot just follow exactly the same program and have success. What you need to do is you can start a program, that's okay, and then you have to notice your body very carefully. You notice your muscles. Or, I mean, you know, you, you run three miles. Next day, are your muscles in terrible pain? Pay attention. Nature, go with nature. That's a sign. Your body's saying, uh, take a rest. That was too much yesterday. But a lot of people, they, they'll just ignore that and they go, no, no, no. The book says today I have to run three miles again. So they go run three miles, even though their muscles are in pain and super, super tight. So, right? They're not following nature, their own nature. And so what's going to happen is, and what usually happens is, usually they get injured. Usually they force, they force, they force. They're, I must follow the program. And then, you know, on the third day or the fourth day, ah, they injure their muscle and now they have to stop. Sometimes people can do also do the opposite. It happens occasionally. Maybe someone's young and they're already strong and you run three miles and the next day you feel fantastic. You have a huge amount of energy. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, I feel great. And the, the book says, you know, take a rest day. Today's a rest day. But hey, your body's feeling great. You're feeling energized. Go for a run. Your body's telling you you're fine. You're, you're, you're energized. Your body's ready for more. So go do it. Go ahead, listen to your body. Follow it. And this way too, you know, sometimes your body, you're feeling fantastic, you're really energized. That's a good day for a hard workout. If, you're, if it's running, then run faster or run longer on that day. 
Or if you're lifting weights, you know, go for, try to lift some heavier weights on that day. And then other days, it's just, uh, you know, everything's tired. And okay, maybe you can try, but you just, you just do a much easier workout. And maybe you try to start that easy workout and uh, nah, still feeling terrible. Okay, take a break. Or maybe you, you feel a little pain in your elbow, right? You're, you're, you're doing push-ups and now you're feeling some strange little pain in your elbow. Don't do more push-ups. That's a little sign. You know, if you, if you listen to that little sign, just this little small pain, it's not an injury yet. It's, it's not serious yet. If you listen to it, if you follow nature, you'll listen and you'll say, ah, there's some little pain in my elbow. Hmm, I'm not going to do push-ups today. Take a break today. And then what? You give, your, you give your arm, you give your elbow an extra day to rest, maybe two extra days to rest. But when the pain disappears, okay, then you do some more push-ups. And this way you'll avoid those injuries. You're going downstream. You're listening carefully to your body. So see, it, it works for English learning, it works for fitness, it works for health, it works for many things in life. We have, you know, this is maybe one of the big problems of our modern world is that we, we're not connected to nature anymore. Our own bodies and our own minds and also, of course, the natural world out there. And so we constantly have this idea of trying to force, 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 trying to force ourselves to go upstream, trying to force ourselves going against nature. Many times we don't even know, we don't even realize that we're going against nature because we're so blind, we're so blind to nature, we're not paying attention. So this is my message to you to, to wake up, to start noticing. Notice your body. Notice your energy as it changes through the day. Notice the little pains in your body. Notice when you're feeling great and strong and notice when you're not. Notice your emotions. When are, when are your emotions? When do you see happier, more enthusiastic, more energized? And when do those drop? Daily, weekly, monthly, annually, yearly? Follow the natural, effortless English system for learning English, going downstream, going with nature, not against it. Just try this in all areas of your life. To stop forcing. It, it makes everything, it makes life so much easier too. So much more enjoyable. You get great results with much, 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 much less effort. All right, so join my VIP program, Learn English with the Natural Way. Commit. Don't quit. You've got to commit still. You must commit. you got to stay a member. Commit. Join and commit. VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Train English with me at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. You will succeed.